The Last Letter by Fritz Leiber Who or what was the scoundrel that kept these carriers from the swift completion of their handsomely appointed rondos? On 10th month 1, 2457 A.D., at exactly 9 a.m., Planetary Federation time, but with a permissible error of a millionth of a second either way, in the fifth sublevel of New New York, Robot Postal Station 68, Black Sorter gulped down 10,000 pieces of first-class mail. This breakfast tidbit did not agree with the mail sorting machine. It was as if a robust dog had been fed a large chunk of good red meat with a strychnine pill in it. Black Sorter's innards went whir clunk. A blue electric glow enveloped him, and he began to shake as if he might break loose from the concrete. He desperately spat back over his shoulder a single envelope, gave a great huff, and blew out toward the sorting tubes a medium-sized snowstorm consisting of the other 9,999 pieces of first-class mail, chewed to confetti. Then, still convulsed, he snapped up a fresh 10,000 and proceeded to chomp and grind on them. Black Sorter was rugged. The rejected envelope was tongued up by Red Subsorter, who growled deep in his throat, said a very bad word, and passed it to Yellow Rerouter, who passed it to Green Rerouter, who passed it to Brown Study, who passed it to Pink Wastebasket. Unlike Black Sorter, Pink Wastebasket was very delicate, though highly intuitive, the machine equivalent of a white Russian countess. She was designed to scan in 3,137 codes, route special delivery space mail to interplanetary liners by messenger rocket, and distinguish nines from upside-down sixes. Pink Wastebasket haughtily inhaled the offending envelope and almost instantly turned a bright crimson and began to tremble. After a few minutes, small atomic flames started to flicker from her midsection. White Nursemaid Seven and Greasy Joe both received Pink Wastebasket's distress signal and got there as fast as their wheels would roll them, but the high-born machine's malady was beyond their simple skills of oil can and electroshock. They summoned other machine-tending and repairing machines, ones far more expert than themselves, but all were baffled. It was clear that Pink Wastebasket, who continued to tremble and flicker uncontrollably, was suffering from the equivalent of a major psychosis with severe psychosomatic symptoms. She spat a stream of filthy ions at Gray Psychiatrist, not recognizing her old friend. Meanwhile, the paper blizzard from Black Sorter was piling up in great drifts between the dark pillars of the sublevel, and flurries had reached Pink Wastebasket's aristocratic area. An expedition of sturdy machines, headed by two hastily summoned snowplows, was dispatched to immobilize Black Sorter at all costs. Pink Wastebasket, quivering like a demented hula dancer, was clearly approaching a crisis. Finally, Gray Psychiatrist, after consulting with Green Surgeon, and even then with an irritated reluctance as if he were calling in a witch doctor, summoned a human being. The human being walked respectfully around Pink Wastebasket several times and then gave her a nervous little poke with a rubber-handled probe. Pink Wastebasket gently regurgitated her last snack, turned dead white, gave a last flicker and shake, and expired. Black Coroner recorded the immediate cause of death as tinkering by a human being. The human being, a bald and scrawny one named Pot Shelter, picked up the envelope responsible for all the trouble stared at it incredulously, opened it with trembling fingers, scanned the contents briefly, gave a great shriek, and ran off at top speed, forgetting to hop on his perambulator, which followed him, making anxious clucking noises. The nearest human representative of the Solar Bureau of Investigation, a rather wooden-looking man named Crumbine, also bald, recognized Pot Shelter as soon as the latter burst gasping into his office, squeezing through the door while it was still dilating. The human beings whose work took them among the top brass, as the upper echelon machines were sometimes referred to, formed a kind of human elite, just one big nervous family. Sit down, pot shelter, the SBI man said. Hold still a second so the chair can grab you. Hitch onto the hookah and choose a tranquilizer from the tray at your elbow. Whatever deviation you've uncovered can't be that much of a danger to the planets. I imagine that when you leave this office, the solar battle fleet will still be orbiting peacefully around Luna. I seriously doubt that. Pot Shelter gulped a large lavender pill and took a deep breath. Crumbine, a letter turned up in the first-class mail this morning. 
Great Scott! It is a letter from one person to another person. Good Lord! The flow of advertising has been seriously interfered with. At a modest estimate, 300 million pieces of expensive first-class advertising have already been chewed to rags, and I'm not sure the steel helms, God bless them, have the trouble in hand yet. Judas Priest! Naturally, the poor machines weren't able to cope with the letter. It was utterly outside their experience, beyond the furthest reach of their programming. It threw them into a terrible spasm. Pink Wastebasket is dead, and at this very instant, if we're lucky, three police machines of the toughest blued steel are holding down Black Sorter and putting a muzzle on him. Great Scott, it's incredible, Pot Shelter. And Pink Wastebasket dead? Take another tranquilizer, Pot Shelter, and hand over the tray. Crumbine received it with trembling fingers, started to pick up a big pink pill, but drew back his hand from it in sudden revulsion at its color, and swallowed two blue oval ones instead. The man was obviously fighting to control himself. He said unsteadily, I almost never take doubles, but this news you bring? Good Lord! I seem to recall a case where someone tried to send a sound tape through the mails, but that was before my time. Incidentally, is there any possibility that this is a letter sent by one group of persons to another group? A hive or a therapy group or a social club? That would be bad enough, of course, but... No, just one single person sending to another. Pot Shelter's expression set in grimly solicitous lines. I can see you don't quite understand, Crumbine. This was not a sound tape, but a letter, written in letters. You know, letters, characters, like books. Don't mention books in this office. Crumbine drew himself up angrily and then slumped back. Excuse me, Pot Shelter, but I find this very difficult to face squarely. Do I understand you to say that one person has tried to use the mails to send a printed sheet of some sort to another? Worse than that, a written letter. Written? I don't recognize the word. It's a way of making characters, of forming visual equivalents of sound without using electricity. The writer, as he's called, employs a black liquid and a pointed stick called a pen. I know about this because one hobby of mine is ancient means of communication. Crumbine frowned and shook his head. Communication is a dangerous business, Pot Shelter, especially at the personal level. With you and me, it's all right, because we know what we're doing. He picked up a third blue tranquilizer. But with most of the hive folk, person-to-person communication is only a morbid form of advertising, a dangerous travesty of normal newscasting. Catharsis without the analyst, recitation without the teacher, a perversion of promotion employed in betraying and subverting. The frown deepened as he put the blue pill in his mouth and chewed it. But about this uh, pen, do you mean the fellow glues the pointed stick to his tongue and then speaks and the black liquid traces the vibrations on the paper? A primitive non-electrical oscilloscope, sloppy but conceivable, and producing a record of sorts of the spoken word. No, no, Crumbine. Pot Shelter nervously popped a square orange tablet into his mouth. It's a handwritten letter. Crumbine watched him. I never mix tranquilizers, he boasted absently. Handwritten, huh? You mean that the message was imprinted on a hand, and the skin or the entire hand afterwards detached and sent through the mails in the fashion of a Martian reproach? A grisly find indeed, Pot Shelter. You still don't quite grasp it, Crumbine. The fingers of the hand move the stick that applies the ink, producing a crude imitation of the printed word. Diabolical! Crumbine smashed his fist down on the desk, so that the four phones and two-score microphones rattled. I tell you, Pot Shelter, the SBI is ready to cope with the subtlest modern deceptions. But when fiends search out and revive tricks from the pre-atomic cave era, it's almost too much. But great Scott, I dally while the planets are in danger. What's the sender's code on this hellish letter? No code, Pot Shelter said darkly, proffering the envelope. The return address is handwritten. Crumbine blanched as his eyes slowly traced the uneven lines in the upper left-hand corner. From Richard Rowe, 215 West 10th Street, Horizontal, 2837 Rocket Court, Vertical, Hive 37, New New York, 319, New York, Columbia, Terra. Ugh, Crumbine said, shivering. Those 
crawling characters, those letters, as you call them, those things barely enough like print to be readable. They seem to be on the verge of awakening all sorts of horrid racial memories. I find myself thinking of fur-clad witch doctors dipping long pointed sticks in bubbling black cauldrons. No wonder Pink Wastebasket couldn't take it, brave girl. Firming himself behind his desk, he pushed a number of buttons and spoke long numbers in meaningful alphabetical syllables into several microphones. Banks of colored lights around the desk began to blink like a theater marquee sending Morse code, while phosphorescent arrows crawled purposefully across maps and space charts and through three-dimensional street diagrams. There, he said at last, the sender of the letter is being apprehended and will be brought directly here. We'll see what sort of a man this Richard Rowe is, if we can assume he's human. Seven precautionary cordons are being drawn around his population station, three composed of machines, two of SBI agents, and two consisting of human and mechanical medical combat teams. Same goes for the intended recipient of the letter. Meanwhile, a destroyer squadron of the Solar Fleet has been detached to orbit over New New York. In case it becomes necessary to Z-bomb, Pot Shelter asked grimly, Crumbine nodded. With all those villains lurking just outside the solar system in their invisible black ships, with planet side in their hearts, we can't be too careful. One word transmitted from one spy to another, anything may happen, and we must bomb before they do so as to contain our losses. Better one city destroyed than a traitor on the loose who may destroy many cities. One hundred years ago, three person-to-person -person postcards went through the mails. Just three postcards, Pot Shelter and poof went Schenectady, Hoboken, Cicero, and Walla Walla. Here, as long as you're mixing them, try one of these oval blues. I find them best for steady swallowing. Bells jangled. Crumbine grabbed up two phones, holding one to each ear. Potshelder automatically picked up a third. The ringing continued. Crumbine started to wedge one of his phones under his chin, nodded sharply at Potshelter, and then toward a cluster of microphones at the end of the table. Potshelter picked up a fourth phone from behind them, the ringing stopped. The two men listened, looking doped, Crumbine with an eye fixed on the sweep second hand of the large wall clock. When it had made one revolution, he cradled his phones. Pot shelter followed suit. I do like the simplicity of the new on-the-hour puffy loaf phono commercial, the latter remarked thoughtfully. The bread that's lighter than air. Nice. Crumbine nodded. I hear they've had to add mass to the lead foil wrapping to keep the loaves from floating off the shelves. Fact. He cleared his throat. Too bad we can't listen to more phono commercials, but even when there isn't a crisis on the agenda, I find I have to budget my listening time. One minute per hour strikes a reasonable balance between duty and self-indulgence. The nearest wall began to sing. Mr. J. Augustus Crumbine, we all think you're fine, 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 fine. Now out of the sky blue come some telegrams for you. The wall opened to a small heart shape toward the center, and a sheaf of pale yellow envelopes arced out and plopped on the middle of the desk. Crumbine started to leaf through them, scanning the little transparent windows. Hmm, electronic soap, better homes and landing platforms, psycho blinkers, your girl next door, poppy whoppies, poopsie whoopsies. He started to open an envelope, and then, after a quick look around and an apologetic smile at pot shelter, dumped them all in the disposal hopper, which gargled briefly. After all, there is a crisis this morning, he said in a defensive voice. Potshelter nodded absently. I can remember back before personalized delivery and rhyming robots, he observed. But how I'd miss them now, so much more distingue than the hives with their non-personalized radio, TV, and stereo advertising. For that matter, I believe there are some backward areas on Terra where the great advertising potential of telephones and telegrams hasn't been fully realized and they are still used in part for personal communication. Now me, I've never in my life sent or received a message except on my walkie-talkie. He patted his breast pocket. Crumbine nodded, but he was a trifle shocked and inclined to revise his estimate of Pot Shelter's social status. Crumbine conducted his own social correspondence solely by telepathy. He shared with three other SBI officials a private telepath, a charming albino girl named Agnes. Yes, and it's a very handsome walkie-talkie he assured Pot Shelter a little falsely. Suit you. I like the upswept antenna. He drummed on the desk and swallowed another blue tranquilizer. Damn it, what's happened to those machines? They ought to have the two spies here by now. 
Did you notice that the second, uh, the intended recipient of the letter, I mean, seems to be female? Another good Terran name, too. Jane Doe. Hive in Upper Manhattan. He began to tap the envelope sharply against the desk. Damn it, where are they? Excuse me, Pot Shelter said hesitantly, but I'm wondering why you haven't read the message inside the envelope. Crumbine looked at him blankly. Great Scott, I assumed that at least it was in some secret code, of course. Normally I'd have asked you to have Pink Wastebasket try her skill on it, but... His eyes widened and his voice sank. You don't mean to tell me that it's... Pot Shelter nodded grimly. Handwritten, too, yes. Crumbine winced. I keep trying to forget that aspect of the case. He dug out the message with shaking fingers, fumbled it open, and read. Dear Jane, it must surprise you that I know your name, for our hives are widely separated. Do you recall day before yesterday when your guided tour of Grand Central Spaceport got stalled because the guide blew a fuse? I was the young man with hair in the tour behind yours. You were a little frightened, and a group mistress was reassuring you. The machine spoke your name. Since then, I have been unable to forget you. When I go to sleep, I dream of your face looking up sadly at the mistress's kindly photo cells. I don't know how to get in touch with you, but my grandfather has told me stories his grandfather told him that his grandfather told him about young men writing what he calls love letters to young ladies. So I am writing you a love letter. I work in a first-class advertising house, and I will slip this love letter into an outgoing 10,000 pack and hope. Do not be frightened of me, Jane. I am no caveman, except for my hair. I'm not insane. I am emotionally disturbed, but in a way that no machine has ever described to me. I want only your happiness. Sincerely, Richard Rowe. Crumbine slumped back in his chair, which braced itself manfully against him, and looked long and thoughtfully at pot shelter. Well, if that's a code, it's certainly a fiendishly subtle one. You'd think he was talking to his girl next door. Potshelter nodded wonderingly. I only read as far as where they were planning to blow up Grand Central Spaceport and all the guides in it. Judas Priest, I think I have it, Crumbine shot up. It's a pilot advertisement, boy next door, or, or that kind of thing, printed to look like handwritting, which would make all the difference. And the pilot copy got mailed by accident which would mean there is no real Richard Rowe. At that instant, the door dilated, and two blue detective engines hustled a struggling young man into the office. He was slim, rather handsome, had a bushy head of hair that had somehow survived evolution and radioactive fallout, and across the chest and back of his paper singlet was neatly stamped Richard Rowe. When he saw the two men, he stopped struggling and straightened up. Excuse me, gentlemen, he said, but these police machines must have made a mistake. I've committed no crime. Then his gaze fell on the hand-addressed envelope on Crumbine's desk, and he turned pale. Crumbine laughed harshly. No crime. No, not at all. Merely using the mails to communicate. Ha! The young man shrank back. I'm sorry, sir. Sorry, he says. Do you realize that your insane prank has resulted in the destruction of perhaps half a billion pieces of first-class advertising, in the strangulation of a postal station, and the paralysis of Lower Manhattan, in the mobilization of SBI reserves, the demothballing of two divisions of GI machines, and the redeployment of the solar battle fleet? Good Lord, boy, why did you do it? Richard Rowe continued to shrink, but he squared his shoulders. I'm... Sorry, sir, but I just had to. I just had to get in touch with Jane Doe. A girl from another hive? A girl you'd merely gazed at because a guide happened to blow a fuse? Crumbine stood up, shaking an angry finger. Great Scott, boy, where was your girl next door? Richard Rowe stared bravely at the finger, which made him look a trifle cross-eyed. Uh, she, she died, sir, both of them. But there should be at least six. I know, sir, but of the other four, two have been shipped to the Adirondacks on vacation, and two recently got married and haven't been replaced. Potshelter, a faraway look in his eyes, said softly, I think I'm beginning to understand. But Crumbine thundered on at Richard Rowe with, Good Lord, I can see you've had your troubles, boy. It isn't often we have these shortages of girls next door, so that temporarily a boy can't marry the girl next door, as he always should. But Judas Priest, why didn't you take your troubles to your psychiatrist, your group master, your socializer, your queen mother? Uh, my psychiatrist is being overhauled, sir, and his replacement short circuits every time he hears the word trouble. My group master and socializer are on vacation duty in the Adirondacks. 
My queen mother is busy replacing girls next door. Yes, it all fits, Potshelter proclaimed excitedly. Don't you see, Crumbine, except for a set of mischances that would only occur once in a billion billion times, the letter would never have been conceived or sent. You may have something there, Crumbine concurred. But in any case, boy, why did you, er, written this letter to this particular girl? What is there about Jane Doe that made you do it? Well, you see, sir, she's... Just then, the door redilated, and a blue matron machine conducted a young woman into the office. She was slim, and she had a head of hair that would have graced a museum beauty, while across the back and, well, chest is an inadequate word, of her paper chemise, Jane Doe was silk-screened in the palest pink. Crumbine did not repeat his last question. He had to admit to himself that it had been answered fully. Potshelter whistled respectfully. The blue detective engines gave hard-boiled grunts. Even the blue matron machine seemed awed by the girl's beauty. But she had eyes only for Richard Rowe. My grand central man, she breathed in amazement. The man I've dreamed of ever since. My man with hair. She noticed the way he was looking at her, and she breathed harder. Oh, darling, what have you done? I, I tried to send you a letter. A letter? For me? Oh, darling. Crumbine cleared his throat. <clears throat> Pot shelter. I'm going to wind this up fast. Miss Doe, could you transfer to this young man's hive? Oh, yes, sir. Mine has an overplus of girls next door. Good. Mr. Rowe, there's a sky pilot two levels up. Look for the usual white collar just below the photo cells. Marry this girl and take her home to your hive. If your queen mother objects, refer her to uh, a pot shelter here. He cut short the young people's thanks. Just one thing, he said, wagging a finger at Roe. Don't written any more letters. Why ever would I? Richard answered. Already my action is beginning to seem like a, a mad dream. Not to me, dear, Jane corrected him. Oh, sir, could I have the letter he sent me? N not to do anything with, not to show anyone, just to keep. Well, I don't know, Crumbine began. Oh, please, sir. Well, I don't know why not, I was going to say. Here you are, miss. Just see that this husband of yours never writtens another. He turned back as the contracting door shut the young couple from view. You were right, Pot Shelter, he said briskly. It was one of those combinations of mischances that come up only once in a billion billion times. But we're going to have to issue recommendations for new procedures and safeguards that will reduce the possibilities to one in a trillion trillion. It will undoubtedly up the Terran income tax a healthy percentage, but we can't have something like this happening again. Every boy must marry the girl next door, and the first-class males must not be interfered with. The advertising must go through. I'd almost like to see it happen again, Pot Shelter murmured dreamily, if there were another Jane Doe in it. Outside, Richard and Jane had halted to allow a small cortege of machines to pass. First came a squad of police machines with black sorter in their midst, unmuzzled and docile enough, though still gnashing his teeth softly. Then, stretched out horizontally and borne on the shoulders of gray psychiatrist, black coroner, white nursemaid seven, and greasy Joe, there passed the slim form of pink wastebasket, snow white in death. The machines were keening softly, mournfully. Round about the black pillars, little mecco mops were scurrying like mice, cleaning up the last of the first-class male bits of confetti. Richard winced at this evidence of his aberration, but Jane squeezed his hand comfortingly, which produced in him a truly amazing sensation that changed his whole appearance. "'I know how you feel, darling,' she told him. "'But don't worry about it. Just think, dear. I'll always be able to tell your friends' wives something no other woman in the world can boast of, that my husband once wrote me a letter. End of The Last Letter by Fritz Leiber Recording by Colleen McMahon